All right, so this is just my model of movement. When your professor asked if I wanted to talk about training in general and the concept, um, it was kind of hard to talk about how I did training, how it directly applied to you guys, because every situation is so different. So what I do at Tampa Prep is largely dictated by what equipment we have, what people we have, all of that stuff. So if I said exactly this is my program, it might not make any sense to you. Um, if you said, why don't you do hang cleans, it's a good exercise, I might say we have 1,200 square feet and 30 people in there. So a lot of things in a, on a piece of paper really will dictate um, or is dictated by what, you are, what your environment is, the type of people you have, how much assistance you have. So just take in consideration that, so the model that I wanted to present to you is more of how I pick and create a model than the actual sets and reps itself. If when we get to the end of it, after I've laid that out, if you guys have any specific questions about how I do it, then that's fine. I just wanted the backdrop to be sort of selecting a process, okay? So the three things I want to talk about tonight is one kind of philosophy. So I think everything comes through your philosophy. And then that's kind of the main thing. So if we're all saying we have a philosophy and a process, that's kind of the lens that we see through things with. So my philosophy might be different than yours, but we philosophically see it a certain way. From that, then we're getting to the theory or the science. So I'm going to talk more about the um, developmental sequence. Dr. Ashley's going to talk a little bit more about the fascia or the embryology. But that's kind of just the straight science of it. Your, your philosophy is a little bit more of customized to you. And then we're going to come back to the end of the application of how to make it work once we have that laid out ahead of time. So I think that your training model is essentially an offshoot of your life model. I think that you can't really separate what you do in training from who you are. And if you try to, it's going to come back and bite you in the butt, I think. I think that that's one of my main takeaways is that in our field especially, you see models of examples of certain styles of training. And if you've been around long enough, you'll see that the 70s had a style, the 80s had a style, the 90s. The 2000s were kind of in the middle of a style change into functional training. And if you seek out that sort of style, and when it's not your own, and you're like, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be this brand of trainer. I like this on the internet. Joe DeFranco does this. It's cool. I'm going to do this. And it's not really who you are. The times are going to change anyways, and you're just going to be left standing there not knowing what you, who you are and what you're doing. So I think if you understand who you are, both individually, then you can layer your training style. And that's never going to go out of style, because that's just the the type of person you are. And there's always going to be people that don't fit your style of training, and there's always going to be people that gravitate to you. And there's enough people in the world that the right people are going to come into your world and train with you if you present yourself the right way, which is just your way. So when I was graduating college my last year, I wanted to write myself down some notes. So I wrote this, and I spent the whole semester kind of working on, for myself, my life philosophy. And I think how I view Life, just the meaning of life is simply to learn. So if we can apply that to strength and conditioning, my goal is to always just learn. It's not to say I know everything. I definitely don't know everything now at this age. But the more I can take in, the more I can learn. Then with that, everything you go through, you can give back. So the purpose of life then is to give it back. So in our field, we give back what we know and what we learn all the time. We're constantly learning new training methods and new ideas. And it's that giving back process. So some people more 10 years ago really wanted to keep their giving back process and everything on the internet was secret and you had to pay all this expensive money for binders and stuff. The internet has changed that. Everything is available. There's nothing you can't learn from anybody now. So it doesn't do any good to hide stuff and be secretive. The more you give back, the more people will follow and like what you do. I think that for us especially, the secret of it all is to be able to experience the process. So we're all kind of goal oriented and say, I want to be here in five years, and this, I want to have this many clients, I want to make this amount of money. But if you're always just looking ahead to the next goal, you're always missing what you're doing right now. So if we're always shooting for this goal, this time, and this thing, and it's just driven towards that, we're going to end up waking up someday, and it'll be 10 years later, and we, it just happened. So I think if we can learn from it, give back from it, and experience it, that's just my general life philosophy in anything, and that translates then into how I view training. Okay. So at that same age in college, I wrote myself a, personal, a professional and a personal vision or mission statement. So my personal one isn't here, but this is my professional one. So I wrote this before I had any clients, before I'd ever trained anybody, before I'd worked in any, with any pro or high school athletes. My goal 
was to have this goal ahead of time. Because once you start the process, you kind of get into it, and you're just kind of stuck in the machine. So I wanted to have a way that I could look back. And now I wrote this 15 years ago, so I can still look back and try to use this as like my North Star. So no matter what I'm learning or what I'm doing new, this is kind of my guiding force to say, am I doing this in my training? And if I am, then I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So everything that kind of fluffs around that, writing, you know, presenting, um, having clients, doing talks, writing books, doing videos, all of that stuff kind of can rest around this, but this has to be my main goal. So that is kind of like my vision statement. I would definitely encourage everyone to have a professional one that doesn't really, it doesn't say anything about clients or work or how many hours. It's just about understanding how you want to represent yourself in this field. Okay. And then as a subcategory of that, I, when I read the e-myth, I wrote down a primary aim. And so in training, this was a lot more specific. The others are a little bit more broad. I'm starting to get more specific into this is kind of how I want people to feel when they come and train with me. Um, and obviously, that's what I want. All of these things, again, it comes back. It's what I want to get out of my own life. So if I see what I want to get out of life, and those are what other people want to get out, then it's kind of a yin-yang. I'm getting, they're giving, and back and forth. So I learn just as much as I give at the same time. So I wrote this almost 15 years ago as well. And this is kind of the goal. So before I even mention sets or reps or numbers or anything, this takes over my kind of pipeline of thinking. So it starts at the top from a basic philosophy, a life philosophy, then it kind of shuttles into more of a training philosophy. Okay, So I think you can't even have a training philosophy until you have a life philosophy. Because if you change or learn different things all the time, that's going to absolutely affect how you train. And if you think you can separate them, it's a lot of wasted energy. You should just be one version of yourself. That one version of yourself might be different with your friends or at home or at work, but it's still the same version of yourself. So the training philosophy has to kind of stem from your personal philosophy. So like I said the other time, I think my basic training philosophy is to feel better, not worse, both mentally and physically. And it sounds so simple, but when we start doing programming or start training people, it's really, really easy to get away from this. If we get sucked into what's current or what's new, or if we've had somebody for six months and we're training them, we read something online, we might be more worried about the sets or reps percentages or the depth drop from the height we're doing our box jumps. But is the person feeling better? Remember, they came to you to feel better, not worse. No one said, I want to feel worse. I'm going to go get a personal trainer. Or I'm going to, go, I'm going to start athletics and, join strength and, and get into strength and conditioning because I want to feel worse. Every single one of us started for at least a simple reason initially that we wanted to feel better. If that's to look better or to feel more confident about ourselves, that's still better. But then somewhere in that training zone, if we get sucked in enough and kind of lose our footing, we get more obsessed about the program than we do how we feel about it. So then we might end up being all dinged up and beat up or really down on ourselves, right, mentally too. We didn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. So it started off as this great thing, and we made us feel better about ourselves. And then farther down the road, we're actually feeling worse about ourselves because of it. If that's where you're at and that's who you're training, then it's not working. So 100%, you have to... Every time, every check, are you making someone feel better or not worse? And it's, when you're training people, that's hard because everyone is different. Everyone, we're not going to get too much into the psychology of it, but I spend a lot of time on the psychology because every person responds a little bit different. And when you're training at a high school or at a college, that's a whole big group of people responding different. So some people need a little bit of a kick to get going. Some people need a pat on the back. Everyone responds differently, and they respond at different times, so it has to be fluid. So how you're responding to someone in their program needs to be geared towards making them feel better. All right? And it has to be geared towards making them feel better mentally as well. So if you're training them, and they're accomplishing these things, but you feel like, I need to be the coach that yells at them all the time. I need to be this person who's just like in their face and telling them how a tough guy I am. They're, they're not going to feel better about themselves. And if they're paying you, they're eventually going to stop paying you. right? Because they're not paying just to look better. They're paying to feel better. And if they don't feel like they're going to feel better, they're going to find somebody who makes them feel better. So it, you can have the greatest program in the world, but if you can't you know, create that atmosphere when they're there with them, they're going to leave. And you're not going to know why. Yeah? I'm so fascinated mm -hmm. by your philosophy mm -hmm. because this year we're currently in your 20s. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely did not have a model, which is interesting. My father, 
got me into working out when I was young, um, teenager. And I was just always obsessed. I think we're all kind of all obsessed about the training and the aspect of it. And the more I dug into it, the more I kind of realized that you kind of get down the rabbit hole and then you realize you're removed from your center. And so every time I got that, I had to reevaluate why did I get away from this? I got so into it and I started looking at this concept and then now I'm two steps away from where I started. And why was that? So it all just kind of come back to the concept of you should feel better. And so I always also want to get to the simplest truth of it all. And I just want to peel away all the words and just the truth is people come to feel better. So I mean, I just dug through it and dug through it. And that's, I guess I'm just that type of learner. Everybody's a little bit different, but um, that's just the way I stumbled into it. I don't really have a good answer. <laughs> it, was, it was accidental, I guess, but um, it just made sense once they got there. Thank you. So once you have your basic philosophy like we talked about, everything has to funnel through that. So if whatever you are looking at or reading or thinking about gets, doesn't make that test of feel better, not worse, it gets bounced out. It doesn't even get entrance into your program. It doesn't, it doesn't work at all for you. It's not doing your job. So from that, Mike Boyle has three basic principles, right? So principles help narrow the process down. So instead of asking a million questions, you can really only ask about three. So first is do no harm. So that's kind of the medical model, right? If you work in, if you're an MD or your medicine, we don't have that sort of doctrine, but they have do no harm. We should hold ourselves to that same standard. People are paying money, we're going to school, we're learning how to make people feel better. So if we're mentally or physically doing harm, then we're screwed up, right? So the same way a doctor should do no harm, we should do no harm. Now the reason do no harm comes before increased performance, if we switch that, and they're the same words in different order, and our first goal was to increase performance. We're strength and conditioning coach or personal trainer, we want to increase performance, and that comes first. If someone drops from a 12 inch depth drop and they, and they do well, then we might try 24, then 36, and we work our way up. So if we put performance first, we might get injured in the process. But we're like, hey, but we were trying to get better. It's OK. Right? That's what they did for years. We were trying to get better. Getting dinged up is part of the process. It shouldn't be part of the process. In the 11 years I've been at Tampa Prep, I've had three injuries. None are weight room lifting related. One, two kids put dumbbells down on top of other dumbbells. And one kid knocked a bar over and hit another kid. Not once has anyone been injured lifting in the weight room. That's probably 3,000 kids in 11 years. So we can do better in not getting people hurt. That should not be an excuse. If someone gets hurt, go back to my first philosophy, learn from it, and then work it back in. Don't beat yourself up, but learn from it. Second, we should reduce the likelihood of injuries. That's what the FMS is for. That's what original strength is for. That's what all of these systems and models are for. At the end of the day, they're just making you do your job better. So people should be less likely to get injured if they're going out and playing a game or a sport because they trained with you. If they went water skiing, or went to play beach volleyball, or just did anything. If they train with you, they should be less likely to get injured. Think about that though. How often has somebody worked out so much that they're more likely to get injured, right? Like I, had a, I, I worked out significantly more in college. It was about 20 pounds heavier. And I had a friend that just asked me once. He said, he, we were just talking. He said, are you sore all the time? I was like, yeah, pretty much. He's like, what does that feel like? And I thought it was good at the time. And now I look back, and how stupid was that? That's just part of the learning curve, right? that my goal to work out originally was to feel better. And by my mid-20s, I felt pretty dinged up. I was 15 to 20 pounds heavier. I was strong. I looked good. But my likelihood for injury went up. Something went a little bit backwards. I started out for the right reason, and I got tipped over for the wrong reason. I think we all get pulled to that a little bit. So then finally, if we do no harm, then reduce likelihood for injuries through those two steps or filters first. If we've done all of that, and, and any of our questions have made it to this point, now we can increase performance. So if any question you have about any program goes through your, your general philosophy of feel better, not worse, makes it past the do no harm and reduce likelihood for injuries questions, and it gets to now the training of increased performance, you're going to have a winner. So your questions are so much less. Now you don't need to be so confused about all of the training. If it doesn't make it through this filter, don't do it. You're going to regret it. You're going to come back and be like, I should have listened, but I didn't, and I got someone hurt. And the worst feeling in the world probably is to get someone hurt, OK? So like I said, it's a long road, in my opinion, to even come up with the training model that's sustainable and long term, that doesn't get sucked with the current trend, but can still take advantage of learning new things. 
It's not a stagnant program, it's a dynamic program. But having a life philosophy of some sort, we all have a life philosophy, okay? Whether it's written down on a piece of paper or you have no idea what it is, if someone followed you around for a week and just tracked all your actions, you have a way of living, okay? You might not be aware of it. It may not be hung up on your wall or carry in a backpack. Like I carry mine everywhere with me all the time just to kind of keep it in my brain, even though I know it by now. But if you, even if you don't have that and you have no concept of it, you have a way of living. So the way that you live will funnel into your professional and then your training philosophy. And then through all of that, you're going to come up with your own training system or model. Whether you take someone else's or customize your own or whatever, depending on where you train or what you do, that has to come through this. You will feel much more satisfied about the way you train and organize your programming. You won't feel so conflicted. You won't feel like you're two different people. You won't feel like you have to put on a mask when you go to work. Like, I'm now this person, but when I'm at home, I'm this person. You know, you can turn up the volume of the version you are. That's absolutely normal. Like, when I'm laying on the couch watching TV, I lay on the floor now, but when I'm laying on the floor watching TV, I'm the same version of the person I am than when I'm at school, but I'm different when I'm turned up at school, right? But it's the same, the same line through, the same version, okay? So make sure that you're running through the same. It takes no energy wasted to be yourself. It takes so much wasted energy to be something that you're not. And then that amount of time that you could be working and getting better, you only have so much energy in a day. You only sleep so much, you have so much from the time you wake up, it's like your iPhone, it's gonna slowly go down your batteries at the end of the day. You can recharge it throughout the day, but it's dwindling. So don't waste it on excess things like trying to be something you're not. Just simply be yourself. And the world works out in a pretty crazy way that when you be yourself, the right people that you wanna train and that you wanna work with will just come into your life. Because you're putting out that message and they're reaching that message out. Your signal is going out that you're yourself and their signal is reaching for someone just like you. But if you're throwing out, you think you're someone but you're acting like someone else, you're gonna pull in the wrong people and then you're like, why do these wrong people come to you all the time? I hate training these people. I hate going to work and training these people. They drive me crazy. That's the message you put out there and you drew them in, okay? Does that make sense? So, the, the lens that I want to look through and have you guys look through is sort of a concept. So, step one is be yourself. It's be the version, the life philosophy and training philosophy that is you. Every single person is their own version, right? I had back surgery um, in 2011. That absolutely changed the way I view stuff. After that, I went and got certified in the SFMA. I learned all about the dynamic sequence, right? Like, if I had stayed healthy my whole life, I'm just going to be honest, I would not have learned nearly as much as I've learned. I'm not saying it's good to get hurt, but it definitely makes you dig deeper. So own up. I feel really confident working with people with back problems now. Right? So that way, I don't need to hide and say, oh, I never got injured. I'm too good for that. Being injured taught me a lot. So be the version. If you went through any sort of anxiety or stress or eating disorders or anything, training your insecurities about yourself, that is your strongest message. Right? People try to hide those insecurities about themselves, but the insecurities end up being your greatest message. And those are the people that you draw in that you really want to help that are just like you. So your own life model is kind of your, your softer version of science. It's kind of your philosophy. Then the lens that we're going to look through is through, before we're even born, some of the fascia and embryology, which is straight science and some of what form we were born, the developmental sequence. So this two things together form the science that we're gonna look at, and then that's how, with ourselves, that we customize our own training or model, okay? So we start with our own view, then we go through how we developed, which is kind of our keys to how we should train people, and then that comes back to making right decisions, okay? So from that point, Dr. Ashley now is gonna talk more about sort of the fascia and embryology and whatever else she wants to add. And then I'll come back and talk about the developmental sequence. So this is kind of where we're at. You are your lens. She's going to go into embryology. Maybe. So in all, when all of that is happening, a lot of that development in the nodes are like day 26 and day 28 of, you know, when you're still in the womb are huge mile markers. Um, I think, let me see. So... How does that, some of the fascia, how does it translate to stuff that we might know? So she get, can go really far down the rabbit hole of the science aspect, but we don't need to because people like her 
can do her job, and we can just refer our clients to them. So we don't need to be an expert at that. We can just say, go see Dr. Ashley, come back in an hour, and they're good. You know, and some of the application of that, have you guys familiar with Thomas Meyer's work at all in anatomy trains? So he started to connect some of the fascia in trains. So I think he has seven different anatomy trains that are all interconnected. So if we look at maybe the active straight leg raise, and the FMS is the first screen, there is connection from the bottom of the foot all the way to the top of the head that's one fascia line. So they're different muscles, but they're all interconnected as one fascia. So that's why rolling the bottom of our foot might help our toe touch. So when we understand that our fascia benefits from hydration is created pre-birth, everything is interconnected. So this is why some of the functional training and different things have taken off mental successful. This is why acupuncture is successful. This is why everything is interconnected with everything. That's what she was saying in very deep words, was that everything starts together and then folds and folds and folds and becomes us. So through that, we can try, even though we're all interconnected, we can track some of these maps. So we have a superficial back line, which is all interconnected. So anything in that line that gets snagged or tight can affect the length and the dexterity of that whole chain. So we call it our posterior chain, right? Anything on the anterior side, so arching back, leaning, any of those positions, anything that gets tugged on that, even though there's a stop and a break, it's all interconnected. On the superficial front side, it's all interconnected. So we have a back side and a front side. We have a functional line. So if we look at when we're on one foot, if we're standing on two feet and squatting versus if we're running on one foot, our adductor functions differently. Okay. So in standard anatomy, when I teach anatomy, we don't just teach this position. We teach that if we lift one leg up, our adductor activates differently. If we're in a 90 degree hip position, our adductor and our TFL function differently than if we're upright. So we don't have to know necessarily all of that. We have to know that it's all interconnected. So the functional line creates an X. So there's one here and there's one here. So everything is interconnected across that pattern. So any sort of tug along that line affects it, and any sort of action that crosses affects it. Okay, And then we have the deep front line, which we can foam roll and get at some of the superficial stuff. Anything that gets really into the deep lines, that's where we go straight to refer out to acupuncture or physical therapy or something, because we're not going to be able to affect the change of the deep, the deep stuff in the fascia, nor should we try. Here's three more. So this is the remaining. So we have a spiral line. So if you've read and follow up on training, more, a few years ago they started getting into how, especially Eric Cressy and different people, how the opposite shoulder is affected the hip. So if we have a, my left shoulder is bothering me, they look at my right hip. And it seemed kind of like voodoo, like why are they doing that? And then anatomy trains made sense of it. So this line, this fascia line is interconnected. So if I have instability at this hip, it's, in connect, it's connected to the opposite shoulder. Okay. And there's another one, obviously, going the other way. So our body's X'd again through the spiral line. Then we have the lateral line. So everything connects from the head down to the foot on a lateral side line. So if we have tension anywhere in that line, it's going to affect the quality of that entire line. And fascia is definitely um, nourished by movement and hydration. So when our body is well hydrated, this works well. But when it gets dehydrated, it gets exposed more easily. Okay? And then we have an arm line. So our lat and our pec kind of connect all the way down to our arm line. So here's another picture I didn't have. It's really cool. But if you're holding on to something, like a pull-up, you ever do it the first time your abs are sore? It's because it's all interconnected down to there. So all of these lines in fascia are just saying that we're all interconnected. And all of these lines were created before we were ever born, before we took a step or before we ever crawled or did anything in our life. These are already here. And they're functioning in all of us. And when they function a little bit out of whack, that can explain why weird things happen in our body, right? Why if my, hurt, my, my hip hurts this time, and then my shoulder, then my wrist, then my neck, and it just seems all like it's random. If, if the reflexive core and this is not working well together, your body just gets exposed in different spots, OK? So this is from Anatomy Trains, if you're not familiar. It's a very, very in-depth book, I think for us at least, on, on fascia. Um, if you understand sort of the pictures, at least, in the concept of it, and knowing that even foam rolling or when to refer out to acupuncture will just make you and your own, yourself and your own clients progress much faster, right? So if you just have someone that just keeps getting stuck, 
You always have the ideal or dream client that just moves perfect. I actually wrote a template for my training plan, and it was just called the ideal client. And they walk, if, if someone walks in to you tomorrow, what would your ideal client be like? There's a certain mindset you would like. There's a certain movement quality you would like. It doesn't mean they have to be strong or powerful or fast. They just move a certain way, right? They basically have good hip and shoulder mobility and are adaptable. So if they do that, then they're probably good here. If they're not, that's going to be affected. So this keeps us from hitting our head over and over and over again. If we can't teach that hip hinge to a client for a year, there's probably something off in the developmental sequence of the fascia that we might be able to refer out for one or two sessions and get them right back in, and now we're a whole year ahead of where we would have been. Okay? So in opposite, or I guess on the same parallel track, um, in fascia and meridians is a book called Muscles and Meridians by Philip Beach. I think it's Philip Beach. And these aren't great photos, but he has hypothesized and created, he's out of Australia, that our body, through um, anthropology and through embryology, has developed certain positions of rest. So we, as a nervous system, our nervous system is our most amazing quality compared to all other living things, that our nervous system adapts so well. Our nervous system is adapted to work, and the opposite of that is rest. So based upon embryology in the development pre-birth, and then through anthropology of how we've rested throughout a society throughout all of time, we have 12, really eight, but 12 different side, 12 different resting postures that when we can attain these, neurologically we're in tune. Our body has a way of resetting itself and resting and replacing itself. So if we can get in all of these positions comfortably and maintain these, our body neurologically is in tune and it will adapt and recover from the daily stresses of life. When we cannot attain these positions or get in these positions, our body physiologically and neurologically is out of tune. And when we're out of tune, we're not resting and recovering when we think we are. Okay? So he says that being in a, seat, in a chair is not rest. Neurologically, our body thinks it's supported standing, supported squatting. So our nervous system isn't actually regenerating and recovering the way it would if we were sitting down in a traditional anthropological way of sitting. Okay? So he has certain ways of toe sitting, tall sitting, long sitting, different positions that we needed to do throughout time that if we, when we could do those, our body would react well with the work that we were doing in the day and we'd recover. But when we can't, most of us don't get in these positions. This is the reason I have a 12-foot wrestling mat in my house now, which is silver, because I don't sit on the couch anymore. So I sit on the ground as much as I can and eat on the ground and do everything on the ground right there. So he um, definitely has a whole book that gets really into depth on his philosophies of this. But the idea, coming back to embryology, the way we developed in the womb, and then anthropology, the way as a species we've developed throughout time, we didn't have couches. And then if we sit in these false positions, our body is not responding to rest the way we think it is. So if we come home and we crash for two hours on the couch and watch TV and we think we're resting, our nervous system doesn't think we're resting. Right? So if we have athletes and clients that when they go home and we think we write their program out, that they're going to recover and train again in 48 hours with us or whatever, 36 or however long they train, and they're sitting in these positions and they're physiologically and neurologically not recovering the way we think they are, then that's going to affect how your program looks to them, right? They're not going to respond as well to your programming. So he talks ex extensively about the importance of the feet and that simply walking on smooth out rocks activates. So in reflexology and acupuncture, there's a lot of spots on the foot. And all those spots help spatial awareness of our lumbar spine is. So we found that people who have poor foot sensitivity have a lot of lumbar problems in the lower back. They can't, their foot is connected neural, for their nerve inputs to where their lower back is. So they have no concept of where their lower back is in space and their stabilizers don't kick in. So he has people walk around, they make in their house, um, they glue down rock mats. They take yoga mats or different things and they put all these smoothed off rocks on the front, in front of their kitchen. And they walk, and when they're doing dishes, they're on a smoothed out rock mat. And they're activating all the senses in their body. He has this really cool drawing where the hands, the feet, and the tongue have 95% of all of our neurological input. And we know our hands, we use those all the time. We know we use our tongue to eat, but we just ignore our feet. And so he activates a lot of the body's rest positions 
and re-stimulates them by having them walk around barefoot, having them walk on different surfaces. And simple things like that go a long way in having hip mobility get better. When hip mobility gets better, back pain goes away, and you look like a genius as a trainer, right? And then you're able to do all the exercises that you read about anyways and want to do. And when they can't do those things, that's when it drives us crazy, right? So those are the two book references as far as fascia, embryology, anthropology that are really, really heavy reads. I'm not going to lie. They're tough. Um, but they also have really good pictures. These are where the fascial lines come from. And so they have really great blown up pictures. These books are really expensive. I hope they get cheaper. And in this, they have the, the different rest postures and what he calls biomechanical tune. So when we're biomechanically in tune, we adapt to and re recover from our rest really well. And when we're out of tune, we don't recover and we don't rest as well. And that just kind of builds on itself. So if we're not recovering from one day to the next to the next to the next, imagine a year later. And then we, we of course, tie workout on top of that and all the other stuff. Yeah? I have a quick question about the postures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was talking about them, but he never, and I looked up, I forget the girl's name. Who was, Anne. Yeah. yeah. He, they never went into like how long you're supposed to stay in the he, posture. They, they say a lot of them I can't get in. Well, I can't, yeah. I didn't try no, it. No, that's, good, that's a good point. So what they say for is use, just like in yoga, use bolsters in different things to make a position comfortable. It's supposed to be rest. So if, if I can't sit in a tall toe sit position, which is my toe being at 90 degrees, sitting my heel to my butt, if, I, if that is uncomfortable for me to get into, then me trying to get into it isn't rest. But if I put a bolster between my knees and a bolster under my shin, and then I can sit there and watch TV, then, and, I'm, and then you're supposed to stay there for 10 to 20 minutes. So what um, he's referring to Ann Hartman, I think it's Hartman, I always get her name wrong. She came to Mike Boyles and spoke a couple months back about these. Um, and she set up all these rock mats as well. And she has her athletes, she works with a lot of professional athletes. And they found that one of the times we're most susceptible to get athletes to do this is after a workout. So they get in one or two positions. So they might sit in a lying or tall sit position for 15 minutes afterwards and maybe drink their post-workout and watch TV. So 10, she says any time is better than no time. 20 minutes would be the maximum. So if we can get in a position comfortably and stay there for 20 minutes, then that position is not a problem for us. And that we shouldn't get any, in any positions that we can't bolster and feel relaxed in. So if we don't feel relaxed in it, bolster it up more. And if we can't do it, just do a different one. Because it's like, it's like a tuning guitar. If I change my high E, it's going to affect the tune of all my other ones. So if you can affect one and change it, it's probably going to change the effect of the other ones. So don't force yourself to get in a position you can't get into. Get into ones that you can and relax, and those will free up space for the other ones. But yeah, that's, I mean, that was a great talk um, on bodybyboil.com or bodybyboilonline.com. She comes and presents at the facility, and she goes through all of it. But um, yeah, the, I mean, oh, does she have it up there? Yeah, so, so, the, so if you want to look it up, you can find it. It's not overly easy to find yet. Um, he's been doing it for a while, but just when I Googled it, it wasn't easy to find. But he knows some of the links, right? You know some of them? Yeah. OK. Um, so if you can get into those positions and get your athletes to just rest in those positions, maybe in between sets. That was a big discussion we had on Strength Coach. Would you want a client to sit in between sets like that? You know, maybe you're going to circuit it. Maybe they're going to sit in a in a, in a toe sit or a kneeling sit is active recovery in between an exercise. So maybe now they're in, we're forcing and creating recovery faster. If you're using HRV to monitor recovery, then you can literally see if they're recovering better, right? If you had yourself do HRV every morning, heart rate variability, you guys familiar with that at all? Heart rate variability is just a way to look at, um, it's, it's, it's in between the heartbeats and it measures how we recover. And, through apps now on phones, it used to be thirty thousand dollars. It was very, it was seldomly lose. Like twice, two places in the in the country used it, and then now you can get a heart rate monitor and your app to your phone, and you can use HRV. And every morning you just lay there for for a minute, and it measures how well your um, variability in your heart rate recovers. The more the be, the more variability, the better. So if our heart rate was down, our heart rate variability was down significantly from last week, it means I might be getting sick or I need to go easier on today's workout. So that's when you can use these postures to actually self-test and see, are, is my heart rate variability getting better? Am I actually physiologically recovering better? And it's a tangible, objective measurement that tells us it's not just kind of the, I feel better, which is still good. I'm very subjective, but you guys might like the objective way. 
So HRV, um, Omega Wave is a huge one. They're a little bit more expensive. I think I have BioForce, which is a little bit less expensive. But you can play around with that every morning and do that, and that kind of measures your recovery. I think, I wrote an article many years ago on boils. I think that's going to be the huge trend. I think once wearable heart rate variability kicks in, and we can simultaneously see how well we're recovering physiologically in any circumstance. So if I'm up here and I was nervous and I was stressful and I wanted to talk more, I could work on some breathing techniques and I could see how my heart rate variability increased. So variability is a good thing. We want high heart rate variability. It's the, op it's the opposite of heart rate. It's the variability between the beats. It's how well our system is adapting. If we're struggling, we have very low heart rate variability for a length of time. And we had a client that was a high level professional athlete like Seattle um, Seahawks, or Seattle Seahawks, I was saying. Seattle, is that the football team? Was by my yeah. blank? Okay. Seattle Seahawks, um, Patrick Ward and those guys use heart rate variability with all their athletes. And they collect, Pat Patrick Ward is their data collector. So what they do is they literally all do heart rate variability and measurement sheets, and they just collect it, and then they adjust their practice schedules based upon how well they recover. They've done fairly well. So, that was longer than I thought, but we'll get there. The developmental sequence. So one aspect of the science is the embryology fascia, which happens and is created before we ever do anything. It's, it's backed into us. Yes? If I wanted to ask you a question about the position, uh -huh. you now or at the end? Now good. So Unless you want me to get on it. I'm going to recommend one position that, that is probably like a yep. I would say the... In either version of what would be called a tall sit or toe sit, so if I'm sitting in this position and I'm toes back, feet together, and just sit back, heel to butt. So if I can just sit in this position comfortably, you should be able to get in this position for 20 minutes. So if we can't, we're lacking maybe plantar flexion. There's all sorts of hip things. Now the opposite, so if this, there's a second version of this position, which I cannot do, is toe sit. So if I can get my toes to 90 degrees, hit my heel, and sit my butt on my heel and just relax in this position comfortably, I should be able to do that as well. I cannot. I have tone issues, right? So Dr. Ashley can get in this position pretty easily, right? So that's something that we would look at. So I'm not going to force myself. I could bolster myself. But I definitely now do sit in this position a lot more. Post-workout, I'll drink a smoothie or whatever, whatever I make at home, and I'll plan out my day in this position. I'll sit down and write, and I'll just shift different positions. So any sort of sitting on the ground. So you might shift to a single leg, kind of a, like a 90-90 position, any sort of position. But I would say this toe sit and tall, um, and the tall sit and then the toe sit where the toes are dug into the ground, that transition position is, I would say, the catch-all. I would say if that gets better and you can do that, the rest kind of fall into place. And if you have limitations, it's probably going to get exposed because we're in full plantar flexion and full dorsiflexion, respectively, in each of those. Um, yeah, well, his hypothesis, well, A, I would say if we cannot do that, we could all do that when we were kids, which is the developmental sequence aspect. So if we can't get in those positions, we have fascial restrictions, right? So if our fascia is restricted, it's kind of like if, my, if I have low tire pressure on one side of my car. Like I can drive here on 275 by pulling my wheel back over, resisting against it constantly, and I'll get here, but I'm wasting gas mileage and I'm putting more effort into it than need be. I'm out of tune. Just by putting air back in my tire, my car will coast straight again. So if I can't, and I'm lacking getting in that position, I'm having some sort of fascial restriction that's causing me to have to work harder to be in basic positions. And I'm going to be limited in end range positions. So if that daily activities, I'm a lot less efficient. So I'm going to get tired easier because I can't recover as well. And then also in training, I'm not going to be able to get to my end range positions as easily, which is kind of where all of our good training comes from, right? So it directly impacts our ability to recover and to just move on a daily basis and maximize our training. So I think it's all of those. That's why we teach it you know, in the class that it has to be, you want to be able to work on that. Um, and you're not going to fix it in one day because it's fascia. It takes a while. But it's just getting yourself bolstered and just working on those positions slowly. It's self -correct. If I can do it for 60 seconds tomorrow, then maybe. Exactly. It's, the, the beauty of, like I said, everything that is good is simple, right? So everything that we go over is just so simple. Be yourself, right? Like it's the hardest thing in the world to do, but it's the easiest thing. Be yourself. The, get into these rest positions. It's the simplest thing in the world. Get into the positions that you could get into as a kid, right? It's hard because we've 
restricted ourselves and we train, we do all these things, but we should be able to do that because it's simple. It's self-correcting and we, should do, we don't need any instruction. You don't need to pay me $150 an hour to teach you how to lay down. You know, but that's a position, that's a posture, lay down, right? We don't need to I don't need to teach you how to sit. You did that as a kid. Go, go to a, don't go to a playground because you look like a weirdo, but watch, watch three-year-olds <laughs> and they'll, figure, they'll do everything for you, right? So this will tie into it, I'll go into it. So developmental sequence, this is all pictures are my brother's baby that he had recently. So I took her so I don't get sued for taking pictures off the internet. So when we are born, we literally have nothing, right? Every, any movement that we have is a reflex. So if you touch the side of the face and we turn, it's for breastfeeding. Touch the hand, they grab for survival, scrape the foot, it pulls in. All of those things happen reflexively, okay? So even though it looks cute that they grab the finger, they don't really know what they're doing, it's just a reflex. So anything that we want to do, we have to earn and create. So when we go back through trying any of these developmental sequences, we've learned it already. We put in the work. It took us nine months to stand up. Could you imagine anyone doing anything that detailed every single day for nine months? So we've earned that, right? So we started in these rest positions, and over time, we got bored, and we wanted to look up and see what's going on, right? So eventually, all of our, our vestibular system is tied to our eyes. So we, when we start moving our head and our eyes around, that started to tell us where the world is, right? So we wanted to look up. My brother loves to take photos. So when we look up, our first weight-bearing joint is our shoulder joint. So we look up and press up. We have great thoracic spine extension. We have great cervical extension. 25 to 30% of our body weight is our head. That's a huge load to lift up. So we have very strong neck muscles. We don't get the right to move our big old melon unless we can strengthen our neck. And then because of that, because of wanting to see what's out there in the world with curiosity and experience, we turn our head and we start to create and see things. And because of that, we develop stabilization in our neck. And one of the first things that leaves us is mobility in our neck. And that everything else just kind of falls apart. So we learned to move through our neck and stabilize through our shoulder. We had full spinal flexion and extension. Then eventually, we want something. So we reach with our eyes and our, we look with our head hard and we drive our eyes in the side of our head and our tongue into our mouth and we reach for something. And eventually when we cry and reach enough, we'll fall over. And when we cross midline, something miraculous happens in neurology, and that our two hemispheres that grew up independent cross over. And now we've doubled our learning curve. So now we have our right connecting to our left and our left connecting to our right. So when we start to first cross midline, we access both sides of our hemispheres and brain together, all as one, before they're independent. They were both aware, but couldn't cross over. When we learn to roll over, now we're, now we're moving. Now everything starts to happen. So one of our first screens is can people still roll over? So think of the FMS. Can we have shoulder mobility and hip mobility? And then can we roll over? which they use rotary stability, right? So they're looking at FMS, do they have rotary stability? When we have that, all is good in the world. We can move our brain functions. And if you look at some of the physiology, just crossing midline this way. Um, Donna Eden, who is a very interesting energy medicine person who I love, she teaches that if we get in a stress pattern and our brain pulls our blood back to our, um, we have our neocortex on the outside, our limbic system is sort of in the middle and our brain stem is the deepest. And we kind of live in our neocortex as modern humans, but our brain stem is our fight or flight reflex. So if we get really stressed, really bad traffic, or get in a fight, we kind of go back to our fight or flight or freeze reflex, which is in our brain stem. And to get out of that, we need to cross midline. So just by crossing our body, we kind of pull the brain, our blood back out of that stress response into being rational again. So simple ways to make people feel better, again, dynamic warm up, crossing midline. You know, simple things that you don't have to get on the ground and roll around all the time. You can incorporate these philosophies into what you're already doing. So instead of just warming up crossing, they might cross. They might bring elbow to knee, they might get better, they might skip in doing this. So now they're activating both sides of the hemisphere and they're activating this crossover pattern. Eventually, we're gonna wanna get up, right? So rock, we, we get into a hands and knees position, which mobilizes our hip, our femur into our acetabulum fully. And if we don't, and if, our, if, we're, if you have a modern adult whose femur cannot get back into its acetabulum, what do we call that? FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. So if the femur, when I raise up, can't go back into the socket, you get a pinch in the front. And that's a huge red flag, because what are you going to do in training? If, you get a, if you're getting a structural pinch, you have to work around that. 
and, or fix it or refer out to it. But one of the positions, this was a huge, the first year I taught anatomy at Tampa Prep, I didn't want to teach rocking. I felt very uncomfortable about teaching rocking. Mike Boyle talks about it. He won't teach rocking. He says it's just too weird getting people, a bunch of kids on their hands and knees and rocking. And I didn't do it. And then the second semester I was teaching it, all of the developmental sequence we were working and one kid came back in afterwards, after the class and said, everything feels better but I just cannot get my shoulder. It's, I've had all these neck and shoulder problems. I've been to a physical therapist three times. I've, I meet the prescription limit for 10 sessions and they send me back. So we went into the restroom and I said, let's just try this position. I don't teach it in class. And we rocked and he went home and he could do it at home in his room. He was a senior in high school. And he came back in the next day and said, I feel great. My shoulders never felt better. He said, I'm teaching rocking. I don't care if it's weird now. So we teach rocking. We get on the hands and knees and you, can, and you rock back. And that's the beginning when you start to tie. So think of a stable core now, trunk stability push-up in the FMS. So can we tie our hips to our shoulders through a stable core? through the X in the stable core. And so once we can rock a ton, if you watch kids, they just bounce back and do it over and over again. And they're activating their pelvic floor and their diaphragm and their reflexive core is kicking in. And once that works well enough, they feel comfortable of crossing into what's a crawling pattern. And that's a huge developmental move to be able to lift up opposite arm and leg and crawl forward. Because now they have to stabilize. They get that shoulder back in the socket, the hip in the socket, and they cross over and stabilize their core simultaneously. And that's a huge triumph because that's walking. That's running, that's sprinting on the ground. That's, that's the fundamental pattern that you learn. If you don't have this, and I've had kids, we know somebody, I won't say, that couldn't crawl well, and they have huge limitations now. As an as a, as a older person moving forward, we're going back and we're working at crawling. And the natural transition is to get up in any way possible, right? So there's a kind of this sitting back on the, Right, so sitting back, getting up, hip extension. And then the transition to standing up is not a one day affair. <laughs> that takes forever to centrate the joint in the hip capsule to be able to stabilize that and then fall over and stabilize that and fall over. It's dynamic stability in the reflexive core with the hip capsule. And then after we try to wobble and stand forever, we try to eventually walk. And we're gonna fall over and over again. We all did it, we fell and we fell and we fell and we found dynamic stability, okay? So that sequence or process, every single one of us went through. So that is already our foundational template of how we move, right? That's kind of our infrastructure of movement. So if we have that infrastructure, anything we want to do training-wise, any type of training sits on top of that because we've learned how to move. And when any of these tend to crumble a little bit or give in, then that's where we start to see problems. So through the fascia and through the developmental sequence, that science, we can screen the body and fix any problems and then layer our good training on it. If someone has, can get in all those positions we talked about and they can go through the developmental sequence, they're your ideal client. But people are going to have these problems, right? So philosophy, I went over theory. Do you guys have any questions on that a little bit? That's a lot, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had 88 year olds do it. But she can't get on the floor or running. She can't, yeah. she can't get off. So can this be taught later in life? Oh, 100%. Um, there's, I would say there's two competing theories, but I, one is that it's pre built into us and we always have had it and we always will have it. Another one is that we earn the milestones along the way because we wanted things. Either way, yes, it can be taught. That's what original strength does, all of these different organizations, they have people from our age on to as old as you can get working on these patterns. My father does this every day. You can get my mom to do a little bit. There's transitions of this. So if we want our reflexive core to kick in and we put a belt around and we drag something while we walk out on a field, that's going to kick in our reflexive core automatically. If we drag something while we crawl, it kicks in our core. So any version of crossing midline, if you're in a wheelchair and you cross midline, you pull an arm up. You're, you're doing the pattern. So yeah, you can, there's no, if you're alive, you can work on it. There's, there's levels, right? I mean, but the philosophy stays the same. The application or the method you choose depends upon the person and what they're able to do. But the philosophy doesn't, that's the beauty of a philosophy, right? It's simple and it doesn't change. Methods adapt to make it work. So um, my wife's grandma, we showed it to her over Christmas two years ago and she got down on the ground and crawled everywhere. It was hilarious. 
She was 88, and she thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Because as you get older, the worst thing in life is not being able to do something you could do. Right? Like, since I had back surgery, I can't sprint. I didn't like to run anyways, but now the fact that I can't run sucks. So not being able to do something is a huge bummer in life. So as you age and you can't do anything, if you say you can cross midline and this is exercise, they're going to they eat that up. Anybody at any age, if you get them down and they crawl or they just do head nods, I had one girl in our class send an extra credit video. If they do this with themselves for five minutes in video and time lapse or get anyone to do it, they get extra credit in anatomy. And um, she had her grandparent who was in a wheelchair just do neck nods and turn his head for five minutes. And that activated all of that. And that was, so she followed the, ph the philosophy and the principles and got that. So yeah, absolutely. Anybody can do any version of it. That's the scaling down of it, which we call like regressions. But yeah, absolutely. So the application, putting it all together, right? So we see it through the lens of our self. Don't be any other version of yourself, you know? See it through, understand that there's science that I'm never probably, unless I really, really want to, ever going to fully understand the depths of acupuncture and embryology. But I can take the work that's been laid out before me and just understand that. I can take the developmental sequence work and just make sense of it and tie it into people's training without them even knowing it. Right? That's the best part. You can make them cross over. You can make them do different things. That's real simple. And they don't have to know that they're working on the developmental sequence. It can just be active recovery or something. So whatever training program you have or like to do, if you think about that first, whether you use the FMS or any sort of system, original strength, DNS, any of these things, funnel it through and look for problems. It's a big net. What can you catch? Do they, can they not do any of those anthropological positions, or can they not do any of those developmental sequence positions? It's all we're doing is catching stuff with nets. If they make it through, good, we're supposed to. But they probably won't. Anything that you catch, if you want to keep training them, which you probably do, funnel into a regression that's safe. We, right? So everything is a regression. So if sprinting is a cross pattern or dragging a weight, then a regression of that is crawling. A regression of that pattern might just be rocking, and then it might be rolling over. They're all just, it's like the tree of movement. It all layers on itself. So any sort of limitation that you have in a, in a client, find a, create a regression and progression sheet for all of your exercises. So, and then that becomes your pattern continuum. So you guys know what a continuum is? So ideally, from the simplest, easiest version of something to the most complex, and most people are right in the middle, you have a continuum of exercise. And as someone gets better, they can move up that continuum. But if someone gets injured or has a problem, you just regress them. So you're not, to me, it's not really changing the exercise. You're not like, we can't do the exercise. We're just doing the regressed version that matches where they're at at the time. And then we build them forward. So some organizations that do this. And you can use them. You don't have to use them as long as you understand it. They're just people out there who get this and are smart enough to try to certify people in it, right? So the FMS is if you're as a screen, which you guys have learned, sort of, right? You guys have covered that? The FMS? Yeah, yeah. just the screen, yeah. And then the SFMA, if you had someone who was in pain, there's the SFMA, which is Selective Functional Movement Assessment, which is how do you look, do a breakout. So then I went and did that after I got injured and learned the SFMA. So if someone has pain in one of the movements of the FMS, you could do the SFMA, which follows a similar model, and you can get to the root of the movement problem. It follows regional interdependence, which is just the idea that everything is connected to everything. There's pain site and pain source. So you see, everything comes back to the same model, right? When she's saying it, when I'm saying it, everything comes back to we're one big whole unit connected. We're not just a bicep or a tricep. PRI is kind of blown up, as is DNS. DNS is more for um, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization is in the physical therapy world. And that is essentially a very in-depth version of what I covered in movement. It is created by um, Pavel Kolar. Um, I think he's in Germany. I don't know. But they've had the system for quite a while. And they understand and correct and fix movement in the developmental sequence at a physical therapy level. So the FMS intervenes at just a training level. DNS intervenes if someone has serious issues that you can't fix. So if you knew somebody who did DNS, you would send it to them and they would work on it. PRI is something that you guys could do if you wanted, but it's just Postural Restitution Institute. They get very particular about pelvic position and rib position and how the core interacts, but it all comes back to breathing. If the body, if you breathe correctly through the diaphragm and pelvic floor, 
multif multifidus and transverse abdominis, everything kicks in, that everything is good. And they approach getting to that position through some um, moving of the hip and different things, but they're all coming back to the same message. An original strength is probably the easiest version for us to implement and use. Um, they look at the exact developmental milestones I talked about and have regressions and progressions in training. And you can use it as a system. You can use it as a warm-up. You can use it as an at-home recovery. You can just take a piece of it. It's just a philosophy. And then they've recently come out with their OSSA, of course, which is their assessment. So if we had somebody that got into those positions and we wanted to look at why they could roll from one head to, they could take one, their chin to one side, but they couldn't to the other, and they get you on the ground and they look at why that is and they help fix that. But they all kind of understand the same concept. Here is just a quick snapshot of like the FMS, if you were to look at how it breaks down, just like we talked about. So the first four, like we said, are kind of the primitive movements. That's kind of the developmental sequence, the beginning of it. So shoulder mobility, active straight leg raise and shoulder mobility. Once those are good, then we look at rotary stability. Can we roll and can we stabilize like the rocking push and push up? When we can do these, we go inline lunge, hurdle step, deep squat, and that's just how our movement gets better. So they did an awesome job of figuring it out, but they also did a bad job initially of teaching to correct the squat first and the way they organized it. And forever, it's been confusing to people when it should be very straightforward. It's just get mobility in your primary joints. Can you roll, which they do rotor stability? Can you stabilize the core? And then can you two leg position, single leg position, hardest position? You might never get to deep squat. As long as you get twos on everything else, you'll be pretty good. So Emma is a swimmer at Penn. She's a senior. She did not work out with me. When she, she went to Tampa Prep. Um, she went on the side, didn't train. I don't know. Sometimes it just happens. And she's a swimmer. And then she came back after college and started training with me. So she comes back in summers and breaks and winter when she can, and, and we work out. And so she, I met her as a sophomore in college, a swimmer at an Ivy League school, wants to be a doctor. So she, had, she was very smart. She looked and appeared like she moved well. She went to college. So of course I didn't screen her, right? I got out. She's fine. And then she started complaining she just didn't recover as well. So I'm like, okay, we need to screen her. And I said, well, let's look at rolling. And let's see if we can get her rolling here. Maybe, oh, let's see. No, doesn't want to do it. Oh, well, she cannot roll. Oh, there we go. So if you watch here, she, it's hard to see, but instead of flexing into a roll, she extends. You're not supposed to use your feet at all. So she, the most simple basic movement of crossing midline, she has to extend her hips. She cannot stabilize and roll. So here, this should be a fluid roll. She's extending in a flexion-based pattern, which means she's doing the exact wrong thing. So her stabilization mechanic is extension in a pattern, and that, that should be flexion. So no wonder all of her training doesn't work. Everything we put on her that we thought was good, Bulgarian squats, single leg squats, RDLs, hang cleans, anything we did with her was based on a system that wasn't using its reactive core. So then we had to use some basic progressions so again, we have a movement. I have a whole folder of just movement progressions and regressions. And then I have cycles, which are training cycles. So movement progressions can be different than cycles. Cycles is just your program, and then this is just your exercises. So I might have this program, but then if someone has a different movement problem, I might take it out and be like, they need to be here. It doesn't have to change their program. It's just their exercise. Oh, that's not good. So one of the things we do is she should have her chin up. We should be looking up in this. That's a pretty hard level. We start hands and knees, and we go weighted. That's much more challenging than it appears. She makes it look easy. We should have her chin up, like I said. So we worked a lot on crawling. Now, you might not have a space where you can work on that, but maybe you can find something that activates something similar. Um, a crossing midline pattern. You can use a double handle out. We did a lot of chops and lifts, so that's crossing midline. So now we're a stable position crossing midline. So that's a way to work on that pattern as well, through chop. And then we can work on that point, once we've stabilized, then we can do one leg RDL. We could do two leg RDL. And then once we get one leg RDL, we can challenge her stability system and see she needs to kick that up a little bit more. But we can stabilize through the core and try to do a one arm row while stabilizing. So now we're getting that fascial line is being stretched. So her, her spiral line is being stretched on one side, making sure so she couldn't get there if she didn't have it. 
Then we're kicking in the reflexive core. Ideally, that glute would kick in and her heel would be about here. But that's a way that we did a progression. So she had trouble rolling, so it was affecting the rest of her training. So do we worked on crawling, we worked on crossing midline, and then we just progressed up the chain. So instead of doing, if we did an overhead press, we might do a half kneeling overhead press to work on core and hip stability. Then we would do a single leg position, and once we got all those done, we're back to good. Because I can't control her training when she's at UPenn, but I can get her body to be able to handle the training when she's there. Okay? That's it. Any questions? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or two. Like I said, build a network, but my personal opinion, don't build a network to get money out of it. Build a network because it's going to make the people you're working with better. And if they do, then they're going to tell their friends and you're going to make more real money, not 5% money. Um, I absolutely would stay away from any of those systems where someone reaches out to you and they're like, hey, I've got this system and I'll refer all my, per I'll refer all my people to you personal training if you refer them all to me for dietetics. Like as long as it's clean, that's good, but the second money starts getting involved or you start recommending someone to somebody because you feel like you have to, if you, you'll know. You, if it feels wrong, just don't do it. Because that's hard to stop doing that. Like I definitely feel there's a strong karmic backlash to that eventually. And we all want to be in the, in the field and getting better. Slow, we want to slow grow, right? Like I think we want to be our the best speakers, the best presenters, the best trainers aren't in their first year. They're in their 15th, 20th, and 30th year. And if you sell out by the first five years, you've, what are you going to do the next 20? You know, you're going to, you've burnt all your bridges. You should be slow growing. You should be planting seeds and building so that you have a farm and a giant village when you're 20 years in of people that refer to you and like what you do and that recommend you. So just be like a, be like a farmer. Plant those seeds and just let things slowly grow. You shouldn't be crushing it the first year. <laughs> It'd be awesome if you are, but like it's going to be a slow grow process. But when you get to that 10th, 11th, when those years start to duplicate, and you look around, you have 10 years of people that refer to you, it will start to open up. That's, I think that would be my parting words is that, I think Mike Boyle said it, that most people in the field give up right before their big break. They've planted, and they've laid all these seeds, and they've done all this grunge work, and they've made little money and worked really hard and they get to the point where like I can't take it anymore and they didn't see that they were they had laid all of that foundation they were right ready to reap the harvest and they think I'm going to go into another field I can't take this and they had laid all of that work and those all of that hard work was about ready to, to sprout for them but they couldn't see that so you're always laying seeds you're always planting seeds you're always doing that right now you're already doing that so don't think you're not laying a foundation just know that you're slow growing this process Yep. <laughs> uh, but it is amazing how many people want to be in our Yes. Already... Exactly. So slow grow it. It's it's there. You have a question? Yeah, I just had a question about sort of along those lines of your growth. Mm -hmm. Like you is your goal to open your own place to teach people how to do all this stuff? Right? It used to be. It's it's not anymore. It's interesting that's a great I mean, it used to be my goal. I would say where I am at now. I don't know what the answer is. I know the vision statement and the philosophy that I want to adhere to, and I'm just staying true to that. And if that manifests into me eventually opening a facility, if that means I stay at Tampa Prep my whole life, if that means I go to a college and be a strength coach or a pros, as long as I stay true to those words, whatever career I navigate, like, I don't ha like I'm a big goal setter, and I finally just stop saying, like, I want to do this at this year or do this at this year. I'm just living in trying to do the philosophy correctly and let whatever happens, happens. Which is kind of a weird answer because I've always been like, I want to do this. Like, I wanted to be a strength coach. And I said at 21, I was hired as a strength coach in college. At 25, I got hired in the NFL. So I got there really quickly, but then I realized if I didn't adhere to those philosophies, I was just going to be adrift. So now it's just really, how well am I doing this today? How well am I doing this philosophy today? And I think everything just takes care of itself that way. People will want to, if you can adhere to your philosophy and vision consistently every single day for 10 years, you'll have to turn down jobs. People will want you to come work for them. People, you will have to say, I can't train you today. I'm too full. My quality of life is more important than having a third or a fifth session. 
I think if you do that, you'll be able to open your own facility, be able to work at a facility, you network and make friends and just do the version of your vision statement correctly, you'll have options. I think if you seek that end route instead of your philosophy, you'll end up being off your path, which is weird because it seems like we should all have goals for that, but it's more about just staying to that vision. I've, that's come true to me more so as I've gotten older in the last three to five years probably. All right, I'm gonna mm -hmm. end now yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you.